Hey guys, I just wanted to take a few moments to talk through some basic things about Athanasius and the two Gregories with a final word about uh, monasticism and Antony. And um, just based especially on um, after having read the responses this week to the reading, uh, just some things I want to make sure were at least as clear as we could make them, just to bring some uh, clarity to what we're reading here. Um, I need to, I'm going to do this pretty qu as quickly as I can. I know you've got lots of things and I've got some uh, kids waiting on me and so I want to make sure I get through this fairly quickly. Uh, first with Athanasius. Um, many of you noticed that he uh, commented a lot on both the humanity and the divinity of Christ. And I think it's important to say that while uh, in Athanasius the humanity of Christ is affirmed, uh, and everybody in the 4th century would have affirmed the humanity of Christ. The Docetists, the, Nocet the Gnostics, all those battles were, had, were, for the most part, behind them. The question that will later uh, surface is, in what sense was he human? Uh, but for the early 4th century, the humanity of, of Christ is a given. And what they increasingly find themselves dealing with is how to account for his divinity. Athanasius wrote this piece on the Incarnation prior to the outbreak of the, Ari the so-called Arian crisis with Arius. And as you uh, hopefully know by now, Arius was assigning the second, what we might call the second person of the Trinity, to the status of creature. That uh, God created the, the Son. The Son was way better than us, uh, exponentially better than us, but nonetheless fell on the creature side of the dividing line between God and creatures. And so uh, he, he certainly may have been the, and was the most perfect creature that ever was, and he predated the, the world and all of that. Nevertheless, as Arius would say, there was a time when the sun was not. Uh, there was a time when he came into being. So what uh, people like Athanasius were having to articulate increasingly after Arius is, is that what we're trying to say? when we talk about the Son? Or is the Son fully God? And so the, the big thing that Athanasius is pushing is the full divinity of Jesus. Um, the, his, his emphasis is on the full divinity of, of the Son, not so much the full humanity of the Son. And as I mentioned in the discussion forum, there are some, actually some things that Athanasius says about the humanity of Christ that would, by the 5th century, be very troubling, in fact, be ruled out. But what, his, his, what he's famous for, what he's known for most in Christian history, is his role, uh, and he wasn't alone, but his leading role in affirming the full deity of the Son. It wasn't obvious that that's what people should do. Um, obviously, Arius and others found a way to read Scripture that... Um, uh, to, to take account of all the scriptures and walk away with the implication that Jesus was, in fact, a creature. Um, what I want you to know about all of these readings we did, and all, what I'm hoping you're seeing about the patristic period, is that they are not simply making up things. The battleground is scripture, and these arguments and debates are largely um, governed by exegesis constantly referring back to scriptures, and so I want you to see that. One of the big scriptures that we didn't see in our reading very much this week, one of the big scriptures that became very central in the 4th century debates was Proverbs 8, where God created wisdom, and this wisdom seems to be personified alongside God, and um, it is through wisdom, or logos in Greek, it is through that logos uh, that God created all things. And so Christians tend to read Proverbs 8 as an obvious reference to Jesus. The question then was, what do we mean in Proverbs 8 when we, what, what does it mean when we read that he was created? And obviously Arius thought that meant created in the sense that God creates all creatures. Well, the, bat, the burden was on Athanasius and others to show why that's not what created means there. So that's just an indication that Exegesis was where this battle was being fought most centrally. Now, um, what some of you did well on, and, and others of you didn't uh, pick up so much on, that the question that I asked asked you to, to think about what account of salvation governs 
the Christology that Athanasius ends up uh, coming to. I mean, why is it that Ath Athanasius is so insistent on the full divinity of Jesus? Now, he writes the, on the Incarnation prior to the Arian outbreak, but there had been enough discussions going on that this was on the table already. Um, and it is, we see the major theological strokes that Athanasius is going to make later in the fourth century when he becomes the champion of Nicene Orthodoxy. It's already all here, latent and on the Incarnation. So what kind of salvation account does he give? Primarily salvation for Athanasius is understood as union with the divine. It is not merely the forgiveness of sins. It's not merely the sacrifice for sin. The word sacrifice shows up, but it doesn't play a, cent a, a, a central role in this reading. Um, salvation is understood in terms of being united with the divine life. And so a text that was important to the church fathers was in 2 Peter chapter um, 1, verse 4. He's given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and you may become participants of the divine nature. That word participant carried a lot of ontological freight. When we are in Christ, according to Athanasius, and I think according to 2 Peter, and in fact, I think this is deeply Pauline, actually. Uh, he doesn't use that language, but the ideas are there. When we are in Christ, we are really and deeply united with the divine life, such that that divine life begins to reshape us. And in Athanasius' account, um, and I was, I was hoping that you were able to, to latch onto this, what this means, uh, first and foremost, is that the incorruption that we experience as humans is now moved, uh, is reversed and moved toward, uh, the, the corruption, rather, that we experience as humans in this body is now turned toward incorruption. Why the full divinity of Christ is so important is because it is the, the fullness of deity that connects with us, that begins to overwhelm and um, defeat incorruption, leading us to how God wanted us to be in the first place. And so you get a lot of restoring of the divine image in us, in Athanasius. You get a lot of union, communion language, and you get a lot of um, um, sharing the divine nature, that sort of thing. The, the most famous line in this work comes in your text that I had you read on page 107. A couple of you actually picked up on this in your responses. Page 107, section 54, Athanasius says, For he was made man that we might be made God. The footnote says, or that we might be made divine, or literally, he was humanized that we might be deified. There are several terms here that would be helpful for us. One is the classical term theosis, which meant this uh, act of divinization or deification. So these kinds of words hang around together. Theosis, deification, being made God, divinization, being taken up into the divine life. They did not mean that you would become God alongside God. What they meant was that you would become a full, that, that you would be able to participate fully to the fullness of your nature. You'd be able to participate in the divine nature. Uh, that, as, as one theologian has said it, God is roomy. And so we, there's room for God in us and that our nature is taken up and changed by that. Um, Nicaea, did not resolve all of the problems. Um, Nicaea was able to reach a, a what appeared to be a resolution through the Nicene Creed, but really nobody talked about that Nicene Creed again until the 350s. The Nicaea happened in 325, and it wasn't until 350s that people started retrieving the Nicene Creed again. They thought they had settled it, and it turns out that there were different understandings of that creed. You read all of this. It wasn't until the 350s that Athanasius, though, really starts championing this word, homoousios, of the same substance, that the Son was of the same substance of the Father. That was the pivotal word in the Nicene Creed. Um, it, but nobody really talked about it again until the 350s. And Athanasius started realizing we're going to have to appeal to words that aren't in the Bible to actually protect 
the theology that is in the Bible. And most theologians ended up agreeing with Athanasius. And that is actually a truth. Sometimes we have to appeal to non-biblical words in order to protect biblical teaching. And so, uh, homoousios, which gets translated uh, in a number of different ways. Um, in Gregory, for example, and switching now to, to uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, um, the, the, the word homoousios gets translated as consubstantial, this of the same substance. Um, at Nicaea, the Holy Spirit had not been front and center. What was front and center is the nature of the Son, and really not much attention was given to the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed originally ended with, after the long explication of the Son, it ends with, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and that's it. Um, the three, the, the uh, Holy Spirit became a greater issue in the 370s and 380s when people started thinking, well, wait a minute, there's this third thing here, and we really haven't commented too much on it. And that's why the Council of Constantinople in 381 uh, gathers, and one of the things that Constantinople does is fill out its teaching of the Holy Spirit, and it eventually calls the Holy Spirit also consubstantial with the Father. The word homoousios is now used not just with the Father, but the Son. And Gregory of Nazianzus was one of the first people, he was one of those three Cappadocian fathers, who applies this word to the Holy Spirit. Now I asked you to... Um, I asked you to think about on what grounds does Gregory of Nazianzus argue for the full divinity of the Spirit? And um, actually what, what many of you ended up doing was pointing to texts where Gregory of Nazianzus would say, well, um, you know, if, if the Son is uh, not fully God, then neither is the Spirit, and that sort of thing. Really, all those statements, though, do all those statements do though is affirm that He is fully God. And my question really was more focused on why is it necessary that the Holy Spirit be fully divine? And I wanted to point your attention to a couple of texts very briefly on page one ninety six in your texts. This is um, section four. We get this statement at the very end of section 4. If he, the Holy Spirit, is not from the beginning, he is in the same rank with myself. In other words, um, he's a creature. If, he's not from the, if he is not eternal with the Father, then he's a creature. Even though uh, a little, he, he's on the same rank with myself, even though a little before me. For we are both parted from Godhead by time. And here's the crucial line. If he is in the same rank with myself, how can he make me God or join me with the Godhead? Again, that language of make me God is not, they're, they're not using it uh, in a sense of make me another God, but to make me divine, to make me participate in the divine nature. Similarly, listen to this language on page 211. Um, page 211, and one of you actually pointed this text out, which was really observant. Um, section 28. Right in the middle. For if he is not to be worshipped, how can he deify me by baptism? Again, deify, making us participate in the divine nature. So he's saying we do worship the Holy Spirit. Why would we worship him if he were not fully God? Because God is who we worship. And if he's not fully divine, how can he deify me or regenerate me, make me holy through baptism? And so, similarly to Ath it's similar to the way that Athanasius argued. The Son has to be fully divine in order to join us to the divine life. The Holy Spirit, then, must also be, Nazianzus says, must also be fully divine because we, we worship the Spirit, we call on the Spirit to regenerate us at baptism. That was already in the church's practice. This is what churches said when they baptized people. And so this is an example of a church practice giving rise to its theology. Here are the things we are doing. How do we make sense of it theologically? And that's not the, well, there's many things in Christian history like that. Um, so Nazianzus ends up giving us some of the classical formulation of the Trinity, where um, Tertullian, way back in the third century, had already used Latin terms to describe God as being one nature and three persons, uh, una substantia, and then uh, the word three attached to persona, or the Latin word for person. And now we get uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and the other Cappadocians speaking to us about God as being 
one essence um, and three persons. And the language that they were using there for essence, was, the Greek word was usia, so one usia, and three hypostasis. They were using the word hypostasis to indicate the distinctions within the Trinity, the three distinctions. Um, there had been a lot of terminological confusion because early in these debates the Greek words usia and hypostasis had been used as synonyms sometimes to name God's nature and it was the Cappadocian insight that we needed to separate these two things. When we think of the word person we need to be careful that we're not thinking of the modern understanding of person. If we were with a modern conception of person if we said that God is one essence or one substance and three persons we would tend to think in terms of three th psychological centers. That's not what they're saying. They're, used, they're simply trying to find a word that names distinctions within God. They're not talking about three psychological entities within the life of God. Now, they are careful to not overstate what they're saying because in many cases, I mean, we have to say God is a mystery. But what he's trying to do, he even acknowledges these are difficult things. We, we only do as much as we can do, and as much as Revelation has given us, but nonetheless, we feel the burden to, to comment on these things. Um, so he's trying to guard, on the one hand, against modalist civilians. The modalists say, or the civilians is another name for them, say that the three names, Father, Son, and Spirit, don't name three real distinctions in the life of God, but rather three manifestations of God, three ways that God shows up, as if God can use three different masks. Everybody uh, was wanting, most people were wanting to reject that in the fourth century, though there were some closet civilians out there. But that he was also trying to protect against the quote-unquote Arian mistake. On the other hand, thinking of God, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit as different natures, so that you would think of God as uncreated, and the Spirit and Jesus as creatures created at some point in time. So he's trying to guard against all of that. And as we saw with Athanasius, um, and as we see in the fourth century, that this is all fought on the battleground of exegesis. You saw Gregory of Nazianzus go through all sorts of names for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And the one word that was especially important in these debates, if they were trying to name something about the nature of the Spirit, they landed on the word proceeds, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Um, <clears throat> the, the Father was primarily known by his uh, unbegottenness. The Son was primarily known by being begotten. Again, these are all biblical terms. And so uh, what, the, what the Cappadocian insight was, that was that really helped propel these conversations forward and help people come to a consensus of classical Trinitarian orthodoxy was that the, the names Father, Son, and Spirit do not name the essence of, of God. They name, uh, they name the certain kind of relation that this, these distinctions have in the life of God. These are distinctions of causality, we, we might say. That, that is to say, each of these three exists in a unique uh, mode of existence, a unique mode of relation. So it is the Father's uniqueness that he is unbegotten, and he is the generator of the other two. It is the Son's uniqueness that he is begotten of God, and it is the Holy Spirit's uniqueness that he proceeds. Now, Gregory says, if you ask me to say exactly what proceeds means, we're peering into a mystery here, um, but those are the words the Bible gives us, it, and so he wants to go with them. Eventually, obviously, he says that words are inadequate. Our words run out. They only help us so far. So the doctrine of the Trinity as one theologian has said, is the least worst way we have found to talk about God. It, it is conceptually straining, and yet it helps us make sense of the evidence that we have in Scripture. And what I want you to see over and over is that it wasn't just that they're trying to make sense of the three that they see in Scripture. A modalist could do that. They also wanted to say, our language about God has to make, make sense of what we're saying about salvation. What does it mean to be saved? 
And once you admit that there's a certain kind of deification involved in the Christian message, participating in the divine nature, uh, then it, it kind of bears on you to, to have to say that the Son is fully divine. And once you admit that the Son is fully divine, now it seems like you're starting to talk about three gods, uh, if you admit the Holy Spirit into that conversation as well. And so this is where uh, Gregory of Nyssa comes in, arguing that, um, no, in fact, we're not worshiping three gods. Now, he is fully committed to the fact that we worship one God. And the way, that, that the way he grounds this is in Deuteronomy 6, um, he says, here's what we believe as Christians. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Everybody wanted to say we believe in one God. Nobody in the debates wanted to say we believe in three gods. That was out of court. And so the burden was, uh, was on Gregory of Nyssa and others to say how it is, as they emphasize these distinctions in the life of God, how it is that they were not arriving at tritheism. And the way that Gregory of Nyssa does this, and the third piece I had you read, is that he argues that the word Godhead does not name a nature or an essence. We're not learning anything about the essence of God by using the word Godhead, Theotes. Rather, he says, Theotes tells us something about the activity of God. It comes, with a, it comes from a word that means to see or to oversee. And so uh, he says, um, when, when these th what these three share, uh, they, they share a common nature, but we have no way of naming that nature. But the nature they do have is indicated to us by a word that names their activity, this overseeing. And he says, they all three participate in the same activities. For all the similarities that some of you pointed out between uh, when we talk about God being three and when we talk about there being you know, Peter, Paul, and, and John, three humans, Gregory of Nyssa goes overboard also to tell us how, those anal how that analogy does not apply with God. Whereas you may have three characters, Peter, Paul, and John, who all share in the same essence of humanity. So when we use that word humanity, we're naming that essence in which they all participate. Still, you can say that Peter, Paul, and John are all doing separate things. He says this is not true with the, with the Trinity. The members of the Trinity always act harmoniously together and, and do the same thing. So the acts of, of the Trinity proceed from God the Father, who is the originator of them. They proceed through the Son, who enacts them and they proceed uh, by way of the Holy Spirit who, who perfects them. So as each is working, uh, they are, while each is working sort of uniquely, they are always involved in the same activity. And so that is the common nature that, that they share. And like Gregory of Nazianzus, he says that uh, they are differentiated by causality, not... Um, they are not differ differentiated uh, in, in a uh, in number. I mean, there's not really three three gods here. There are three distinctions within the life of God. Maybe an analogy is helpful. I've always found C.S. Lewis's helpful uh, analogy helpful in mere Christianity. Um, he when he tries to describe the eternal eternal distinctions within God, he says, suppose there are two books on the table, and one is resting on top of the other. And it is eternally that way. Then the book on top is forever in a position of resting upon the first one, and the book on bottom is eternally in the position of supporting the one on top. So they have different modes of existence. And I think that that is a helpful analogy for us to think about the eternal relations. That the Father is the generator of all things. But this generation, as Origen had already de determined in the third century, that generation of the sun is an eternal event. There never was a time when that wasn't happening. And so the word that's used uh, eventually by the church fathers to name this, this interrelationality of the Trinitarian members, um, as it's expressed in the Cappadocian fathers, the word that's often used to describe that later in history is perichoresis a Greek word that means interpenetration. Um, it, it does have some sexual overtones uh, with it. Some people think of it as a divine dance. These are not 
three beings, three different psychologies. These are three distinctions within the life of God and, that, and what God is. Let's say it this way. What God is, is the eternal relationality of these three. So to say God, you can segment the Father off as God alone by himself is not sufficient in Christian theology. What God is, is the eternal relationality of these three. Okay, those are some, uh, some words about uh, Athanasius and the two Gregories. And then very quickly, very quickly, just want to say something about monasticism. A number of you commented on uh, your appreciation for the monastic tradition and your interest in reading the life of Antony. Some of you raised the concern that maybe the monastic impulse was too uh, isolationistic or individualistic. And some of you even raised concerns about the practices of asceticism, uh, the, the worthwhileness of such practices. Um, I commented in a couple of threads, but I, I don't know that everybody was going to see it, so I, I thought I would say it here in this way. It is possible that the monastic, the monastic tr tradition represents a flight from reality, a flight from the world, and a flight from community. There certainly are ways in which that did happen historically. I won't defend uh, against that. However, monasticism, when it is at its best, sees itself, the monastic tradition sees itself as being a unique gift among the whole range of gifts in the church, a unique gift that is given on behalf of the whole church. And you can think about the way this works. The, monast the stories of monks like, the, like Antony were, were being circulated and were very popular in the 4th and 5th century. People were gaining courage to bring their passions under control. They were ga gaining a lot of motivation. They were inspired by these stories. And so on the one hand, you think, wow, Anthony, you're, you're running away from people. This is not what Jesus calls us to. Uh, as one of you said it, I don't think God calls the mainstream of Christianity to this. However, God may call some people to a life like this. Think about all the people who are reading these stories today. The lives of these monks, though they were, though they were removed from regular daily life, became a gift to the larger church to inspire them in their own discipleship. And so it's not the case, I don't think, that merely retreating, even for a lifetime, is against the gospel. There are a range of gifts given to the church. Now, um, as I said, sometimes the monastic tradition could turn in on itself, and then they, there would come periods of reform. Um, and one other thing to point out about this was how inspiring the monks were because most of them, or especially early on, were uneducated. Anthony was uneducated. And this is what's really going to inspire uh, St. Inspire Augustine later in the 4th century when he's trying to learn to bring his passions under control and he hears that this, there's this uneducated monk out in the desert doing it. He read the life of Anthony. And this really inspires them that he too can learn to bring his passions under control. So their lives turn out to be gifts. And as you, as you notice, um, the church finally decided in lar at large that um, it was better for monks to live in community. And so the idea of the isolationist monk really tended to, to fade out fairly quickly, actually. And the norm, the normative way of practicing monasticism came to be genetic monasticism, living in communal quarters. Now, I've said a lot of that very quickly, and uh, I, I, uh, perhaps I've muddied it more than I've helped, but uh, the main thing I wanted you to hear, especially in the uh, Athanasius and the Gregories, was how important their account of theosis and divinization was to the way that they came to talk about Jesus and the way they talked about the Holy Spirit. All right, God bless you guys in your ministry, in your work that you're doing, and I uh, hope you enjoy reading Christology this week.